Okay, thanks, Rob. A um, lot to cover. So just to first define the venous compression syndrome, the most common one, the May Thurner that we all discuss is the crossing of the right common iliac artery over the left common iliac vein. But I think that's not where it ends. You have all of these different points at which the ar pulsating artery is up against a bony structure posteriorly. And along any part of that, you can have an external venous compression. Obviously, tumors, nodes, these can also cause venous compression if you have some sort of pathology in the pelvis. So when we talk about chronic venous disease, this is a slide similar to Keith's. We're talking about deep obstruction, deep reflux, and superficial venous reflux. It's important to note that actually deep obstruction is the least common reason for chronic venous disease of these three. But if we were to take that subset of patients, they can be divided into the post-thrombotic group and the non-thrombotic group. So this is an example of a non-thrombotic uh, venous compression. And here you can see the bifurcation of the uh, common iliac artery into the external and the internal, and this is actually the external iliac vein. Similar to the case that was alive before, this is being sandwiched between the vertebral body and that internal iliac vein uh, artery right there, and that's your, that's your compression. It's not the classic May Thurner. This is taking that patient to venography and IVUS. You can see before, this is, what, this is the size of the vein. Uh, above it or below it, I don't remember which, it's much bigger and normal. And this is post-stenting. This is the sort of picture you're going to see in these non-thrombotic patients. So then what about the post-thrombotic syndrome? You saw, you saw this patient. This is an example of venous compression causing, causing thrombosis. So this is a patient with a healing ulcer, although it's not healed yet, and he keeps opening this ulcer up. He has a history of extensive iliofemoral thrombosis and was noted to have a May Thurner lesion. So it's important that when you look at that chart to realize that a venous compression lesion can either be thrombotic or it can lead to further thrombosis. There's no doubt that it predisposes patients patients to uh, uh, thrombosis, especially if there's a second factor involved. So in this particular patient, his May Thurner had already been stented, but he had what, what Dr. Raju calls a Rokitansky lesion along the rest of its length, where it's still sort of small and post-thrombotic, although on IVUS, you, you'll see it, it's actually not thrombosed per se. But this is the stenting after, uh, after uh, getting access through this. And particularly in this area, uh, we needed to extend the stents. And you can see this is going all the way to the femoral head, ultimately. The pre-intravascular ultrasound looks something like this, the post looking something like this. So uh, on follow-up, he healed his ulcer and had less edema overall. So then when we break down our stenting cases into non-thrombotic, acute thrombotic, and chronic post-thrombotic, this is the same paper that Rob showed by Mahmoud Razavi. Uh, these are the sort of success uh, rates that we're getting. So the technical success, success is unsurprisingly in the 90s. When you're talking about bleeding, you have a very low rate of bleeding with these patients, even though we keep them anticoagulated during the procedure. PE is very rare. The per periprocedural mortality is obviously very rare. We wouldn't be doing this routinely in outpatients. And then early thrombosis is also pretty rare, but it, it can happen. It, it happens in less than 10% of patients. Now, how good is it as far as efficacy? Well, you know, when you look at things like complete pain relief, it's not bad. I mean, we're talking about seven out of 10 patients typically getting complete pain relief. Edema, you know, if patients come in with only edema, you have to tell them that there's a third of a chance that they're not going to actually um, improve their edema uh, to the extent that they want to. Ulcer healing is pretty good, but again, they're not always going to heal also, there are other patient characteristics that might be involved for this. You saw this, but the primary patency appears to be higher for non-thrombotic stents than for chronic post-thrombotic stents. That's not terribly surprising. Secondary patency goes up for all of them. So the outstanding questions for these venous compression lesions, what is the definition of a venous compression lesion? So for example, should we be relying on venography? Should we be relying on IVUS? Now IVUS, we have been shown by the video trial, is more sensitive than venography, but does that mean that we we should be acting on it. We don't know the answer to that, quite frankly. Should we routinely stent patients with venous compression lesions? If not, in whom? The severe, those with severe post-thrombotic disease, or how about non-thrombotic disease with at least C3 classification? We have senses of what we want to do, but the data is not yet there. Should we be stenting patients with other risk factors to reduce the risk of DVT? A very provocative question. I think most of us would say no, but there are a lot of outstanding questions when it comes to these lesions. Fortunately, at least for a subset of these patients with, with moderate to severe post-thrombotic syndrome, 
and the and iliofemoral DVT or a chronic iliofemoral DVT, there's this trial coming. Suresh, as you heard about, uh, was a principal investigator for the ATTRACT trial. This is the C-TRACK trial, and we are actually randomizing patients to receive endovascular therapy versus conservative therapy, and we're, we're going to see after six months which group does better. So in conclusion, venous compressive lesions can result in either non-thrombotic or post-thrombotic disease. They can be very sym symptomatic even if they don't have associated thrombosis. The C-TRAC trial will hopefully answer many questions about moderate to severe PTS with iliofemoral obstruction. We do need a similar study for non-thrombotic disease. Hopefully some of us can get together and do that. And we're not totally sure still what to do with the increased sensitivity of IVUS.